All right, let's get started. Um, okay, so most of you, I met with all of you last week to do project proposals. That was great, lots of great ideas. Please reach out to Matt uh, to get parts, put your orders in for parts. Actually, it's part of the announcements anyways. Um, but the earlier you can get that done, the better. I encourage you to find time to actually go to the lab and meet with Matt. He'll open up the bins and give you lots of things to look for, if, especially if you don't know exactly which screen you want, that sort of stuff. Meeting with Matt in person is a lot easier. Okay. Um, I think I talked to most groups need to do some revi proposal revision. When you submit that in your project folders, please create another proposal. Don't just revise the existing one just so we can have a record of it. Um, there was a few groups where I said specifically no, but this is really an opportunity for you to just clarify for yourself what it is you're doing. And when we come back and project milestones and say, well, you said you're going to do this, you want to have a, but you actually did something else, at least you want to have a record that says, no, this is what we all agreed on. Turns out I forget things. So having a record will, will help, uh, help us. Um, parts list for Matt, I highly encourage you to do it by this week. It'll make your life better and make Matt, Matt's life easier. Uh, project or homework sevens due, should be released already. And um, I never got a chance this weekend to actually do your project or your class proposal assignments, but I'll do it tonight and send them out to you guys. Um, and then you'll give those in class. Just a reminder, uh, you'll first, your group will give a presentation on some topic. Um, you'll do a, a rehearsal with either me or Matt for 25% of that, that graded component, and then do a 75% in class. The rest of the class will fill out a small evaluation for you through Google Form. So it's expected that everybody is here to watch the rest of the proposals, and class participation points will be awarded based on your ability to fill out the forms. All right. Any questions about logistics? Things coming up. Zero questions. Perfectly clear. Fantastic. How do labs work after all that stuff? Uh, we have more no more labs, so you can go during that pr project time is a great time. Since you and your lab mates have already have dedicated time on your schedules, go there and work on your projects. There's also open lab hours uh, for 373, and then you can still work in the labs any other time as long as there's room, but you have to give if you know, 473 has all the workbenches and there's no room for you, you're going to have to give up your workbench. But that's about it. Yeah. Like IELTS hours should be all the same hours? Should be the same hours, yeah. Yep. Any other logistics questions? And then eventually we'll stop coming to class all together. Woohoo, right? With the expectation that you'll spend those, time, those hours on your project, right? It's not like a free lunch where you don't have to do anything. In fact, you get to do more things, which is uh, your project. All right, let's go forward. So now we're in the world of analog. We're gonna, I particularly like the analog parts because it's where we can take the physical world, the, the world that lives outside your microcontroller and start digitizing it and doing something, right? So this is kind of like how we interface with the external world. So we'll talk about signals in general for about half the class today. Then we'll talk about uh, ADCs, analog digital converters, and probably tomorrow we'll get to DAX, which is, uh, analog to, or digital to analog converter. So you could go and output an analog tone if you wanted to. So this module is all on just review of analog signals. Um, there is a wide group of people here. Some people have taken, I think it's 217, is that signals? 216, 216. I didn't go to grad school or undergrad here, so I don't know any of the course numbers. Um, still playing along. Um, but some people haven't taken it, so it's good just to kind of review some of that stuff. All right, um, okay, so digital, when you think about the uh, digital world, or the physical world, right, it's a bunch of things that we can measure. Most of the interesting things are analog in some way, right? So you have uh, sensors that can measure sound, for instance, um, temperature, all these are, are analog values that you need to make, have digital systems make decisions on, but you still need to acquisition them in some way. We also use analog a lot for control systems. Um, many things can be done in digital, but for instance, you can control certain sensors or LEDs or other things with analog values. Usually it's interesting analog or motors and stuff like that. Um, not DC motors, but other ones that you can do with analog. Um, examples that you would think about are microphones, right? You can digitize uh, the sound and then you can play it back with speakers. Probably in our, the world of electronics, you can essentially think of this as a function generator and an oscilloscope. 
So we're kind of trying to reproduce those capabilities on your chip so you can understand uh, the world around you. So sampling rate, sampling rate is the rate at which you sample some analog voltage. Um, you can either set that up with timers. Uh, you could, if you were really insane, wanted to do it in, in code and use no ops. I've certainly seen that, not advisable, but usually you do timers to set off an ADC read so you have this dedicated period of time uh, to do uh, ADCs, you know the interval is some fixed amount. Oftentimes we think about the quality of our oscilloscopes as how fine a resolution is it? How many bits can you get? But really it's also how, how good is the time base? Because if you're fluctuating a lot, you're dithering in time, you don't know exactly when you sample that can mess up your waveform and you won't be able to understand the waveform. It gave me a look like I'm, like I'm extra crazy today. What questions do you have? You good? Okay. All right. Um, so sampling rates you're probably familiar with. You know, CDs are 44 kilohertz. Um, medium sound, 22 kilohertz. And then like phones are, phone calls are really low rate. They don't care about high fidelity. They're trying to get some version of your voice through. So phone is actually pretty uh, low quality signals. How many here have heard of Nyquist Shannon sampling theorem? Really? I feel like you, some people are shy, some people are computer scientists, that's fine. We like everybody here. Uh, Nyquist sampling theorem basically is a, is a mathematical way of, of proving how fast you have to sample a signal in order to recover it. So basically you need to double, without, without incurring aliasing, you need to sample a signal twice as fast to be able to recover it. Yeah? What's that? Oh, we'll go over that in just a second. Aliasing is where, um, mm -hmm. say you had a very fast signal and you undersampled it. Oh, okay. Um, we'll go through that in just a second. So, uh, Nyquist Shannon assumes that there's um, no noise or jitter in your clock for that to be a, a functional, acceptable, and that's one of the hidden errors in your uh, analog digital measurements. All right, so. Take a second, what do you think the sampling rate of this signal is? Three kilohertz. Three kilohertz. Three kilohertz, sure. Yeah? Two kilohertz. Two kilohertz, yep. Um, I know it's probably hard to see uh, without having it right in front of you, but it is two kilohertz, yes? Um, what's the frequency of the signal? Um, it could be very high, like a thousand kilohertz, because it might like have aliasing, or it have like two uh, two kilohertz. Uh, okay, so the the sampling rate is the time between these two points, right? So that's the sampling rate, and then okay, what's the most like? What's the obvious answer here? Let's go with that one for the. Um, for the frequency of the sine wave or the waveform shown there. Till kilohertz is a sampling rate. 200 hertz, sure. And so this is how we, you look on an oscilloscope, you kind of look at this thing, okay, I can figure that, here's some points, and oscilloscope usually goes and um, puts a nice little line through it, right, okay. So you got this, this is kind of like the normal base scenario. You're sampling at some rate, and you're probably sampling fast enough that you can see the signal itself. What questions do you have? I clearly tell that you have lots of questions. I just, why 200 hertz? Uh, I would say the, the period from here to here. Oh. Yep. Um, why, what was the sampling rate? I would say the sampling rate is the time, the, the rate at which you're going from one sample to another one. So if the blue dots are the samples, right, so you take this time and then invert that. And that's your frequency, that's how often you're sampling. All right, so that, this is like the, the base case when I pull up oscilloscope, this is what I kind of assume is happening. But then it can go wrong, right? There's ways to go wrong. So what's the sampling rate for this thing? Or, or the sampling rate's the same. What's say the, um, oh, I gave it away, damn it. I would ask what, what is the, the frequency of the signal? And here it looks like it's DC, right? 
Is this a direct DC? But it could be if you sample that the magically wrong frequency, right? You could happen to just sample every time uh, at the same rate of the frequency and it would look like DC. What? Okay, I got some people saying yes, some people saying this is the craziest professor I've ever met, yeah. Yes. It would be a very special case because all of a sudden you're looking at this and you're saying, oh, it happens to be perfectly in phase and time, or not in phase, but perfectly the same frequency, which would be pretty rare. Normally you'd see this signal at least oscillate a little bit in the real world. Okay. And then what happens when we, we sample too fast? Our, our, our signal is much faster uh, than our uh, sampling rate. You could have something like this. This is the case here where you're sampling your signal is uh, much faster than your sampling, and you happen to be undersampling it. Right? And so this is, the, this is the error condition. This is what you don't want to find uh, on your oscilloscope or your ADCs, because you're missing the signal. Basically, you're going to undersample it so many times, and you're going to be, you're going to think it's going to be one frequency, but it's not. Okay. And we'll talk about all the ways to deal with these signals, uh, these issues in a second. And then, you know, sometimes it gets messy. All sorts of weird things can happen. You can have sinusoids on top of sinusoids on top of sinusoids. So here you can go, if you look through it, you can figure out this is a combination of like 100 hertz, 400 hertz maybe, and 1600 hertz. Um, so just because, um, yeah, just because Nyquist says, oh yeah, you're able to, if you, go tw if you sample twice as fast, you're gonna be recover the signal. Doesn't make it easy, it just means it's recoverable. Doesn't mean it's, uh, uh, usable it just means that you can detect that it exists. All right, so that comes to what I call the oscilloscope sampling theorem. We got night quick sampling sampling theorem. That's great. All those theoretical guys telling you the the, the rate at which you got to go to recover signal. I say the oscilloscope sampling theorem. You have to go five times faster than the signal you want to measure. Okay, that's about it's a good rule of thumb because that means if you look at it, there's enough extra data points to actually visually understand the signal that you're looking at. Sometimes 10 times is a nice number. I call it the, you know, the sampling, the oscilloscope sampling theory. Um, if you notice that all your um, oscilloscopes say things like, this is, you guys probably can't read it there, but 200 giga samples per second. What does that mean? What is, oh, this is five, uh, this is 200 megahertz, right? But it's, the oscilloscope says five giga samples per second. What are these two numbers? Why do they exist? Yep, it's five giga samples per second. That's how, but it says right there, 200 megahertz. What does that mean? Why, why are these two things on there? Effectively, yeah. What it's saying is um, there's two specs. There's one, how fast does this piece of equipment go from an analog point of view? So the signals going into these probes here, or into these ports, going into the machine, what's the fastest signal that it can do from an analog point of view? Say 200 megahertz. But it, the whole machine can sample at five giga samples per second. So why can't it go to five gigahertz? Well, there's also saying this is the sampling rate across all four devices, or all four ports. Right? And they want to allow you some headroom so that you can actually visualize the signal. Because this having, if you sample that double the signal, it, it's going to look hard to understand what it is. So if you did the math, you'd say, uh, so 200 megahertz across four channels gives you about um, 4.25 times Nyquist. So 4.25 is faster than uh, 200 megahertz. So that's about the sampling, the, you know, my personal sam oscilloscope sampling theory, which is you got to go five times faster or so to recover the signal in a way that's actually usable for anybody. Okay. Oh, I put it here. Fantastic. Um, so analog digital converters, um, you know, the goal here is you're going to take some continuous Analog signal, okay, oh, I should, should have said this. Um, all your 216 professors are gonna laugh at me. I'm trying to do all of 216 in uh, one slot, or 
half an hour or 45 minutes. I'm gonna get it all kind of, it's gonna be really touchy feeling and that's okay. I just want you guys to gain intuition so that when you're actually plugging things into your uh, ADCs, you understand why is this signal crazy. So a little caveat, I'm not trying to do 216 in one, in one show. Um, so anyways, uh, the job of the analog to digital converter is to take some time, some continuous time varying signal and quantize it into discrete values. So it's gonna be quantized in time, it's gonna be quantized in magnitude as well, or voltage. I guess I should have said that ADCs are typically always voltage measuring devices. I bet we can invent or find some research paper that did a current ADC. Um, usually they're always voltage devices. All right, so you're gonna take some digitize some discrete values or some analog signal, so here, and you're gonna quantize it into steps. Right? And the, the, the more ADC bits you have, the finer you can make that steps. So basically it means for some input voltage, there's a mapping to some digital code that represents that, okay? And basically you have to figure out how many bits do you have in your system and what is the range of the ADC. Uh, so in this particular case, this is zero to two volts, okay? And then you have to say, okay, I'm gonna break that step, break that into um, eight different values or however many uh, bits you have, and that's gonna be how I convert one to another one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what if we need like more than three bits? What if we need like 16 bits? You better go get an ADC that has 16 bits. Oh, so there's only two volts in total. So, uh, so like if we like have 16 bits, how does it like tell difference from like very subtle uh, change up to the voltage? So let's just say the, the input voltage range of your ADC was zero to two volts. We could change that if we wanted to. And then say you, you don't want a three bit ADC. That's garbage. Nobody wants to buy that. So you're gonna make yourself a 16 bit ADC and you can just go map zero to zero volts to two volts uh, and break it over end to the 16, right? And then you have lots of little steps inside there. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. What other questions do we have? Okay. Um, so resolution, we talk about the size of the voltage step that you get. So if you want higher resolution, that means you need more uh, ADC bits to break that little value, or to break it into little quantized chunks. There's kind of two ways of doing it. Um, it actually doesn't matter if you get, it doesn't really matter that much if you, when you get really high ADC values, uh, sorry, large number of bits, but um, some manufacturers will say, okay, well, it's just the top of the staircase or they'll just average it out. They basically slide it over this way, halfway, so that you're about halfway through the bits so that your, your error is evenly distributed um, rather than biased in this case, all the way to one side. Um, not that big a deal when you get to really large ADCs. We'll talk about, when we get to ADCs, we'll talk about error sources in ADCs, and you'll find out like the lowest bit of any ADC is almost lowest bit or lowest two bits is almost garbage anyways, just because of system noise and how ADCs work. But um, this is just to say that they do uh, try and distribute it evenly if they um, uh, set it, offset it uh, by half a bit. Okay. And then ADCs inherently have quantization error, basically just saying that because of how you've broken up that ladder, there's an inherent amount of unknownness. So this is the quantization error. So as you go up and you choose this value, say it's that you've measured three, well, you don't know if it's actually three volts or if it's negative uh, 3.5 volts or negative 2.5 volts, you don't know because there's an inherent amount of error. And so every uh, mechanism here has some amount of quantization error. I can't tell if you're bored or confused. Yes. Can you explain the quantization error? Sure. So if you had a binary ADC, Right? And it just can say, if it's over VDD over two, then it's a one, and if it's under VDD over two, it's zero. That's, there's a big amount, large amount of error in that signal. Right? You're gonna give a value of one or zero, and it could be 
a lot of different values, right? And so what you can do is you can have higher and higher resolution ADCs to reduce that unknown. Does that make sense? This is the error, the quantization error. This is how off that signal is from the true value. So is it off by negative 0.5 and positive 0.5 at the same time? It depends where you are, right? So here, this is a, supposed to be a line. So if I'm right here, if I chose my input voltage was uh, 3.5, I put 3.5 and it said uh, you've measured with your ADC says the mapping would go to three volts. That's because you don't have more slices. So you're saying it's three volts, but it's really off by half a bit or half a volt here. And then as you go up to two, uh, sorry, that was if you're at four, and then you go up to three, now it's off by a whole bit. Or sorry, it's off by uh, half a volt, and then it keeps toggling up and down. So it's just telling you that you, you know, how coarsely you measure defines the amount of error in your signal, but you don't know. What other questions do we have? OK. Uh, why don't you take a moment and work on this for 90 seconds? Say you have a 12-bit ADC. What would be the quantization error of a 12-bit ADC? Say your scale is from 0 to 3 volts. You guys can talk to each other, use calculators, whatever you like. Is it, uh, or is it, is it, is it an error? Like, if, it, if you hear like into like 16 bits, like, mm -hmm. maybe just millivolts. Uh, the noise from there. So it, it might be cost some errors, right? Yeah. Then how do we solve this kind of problem? I mean, it's a fair question. I guess the real question is what are you trying to accomplish? How much noise can that measurement tolerate? And what simple processing mechanisms can you come to overcome that? Right, so there's quantization noise, sure. Then you have system noise, noise in the signal itself, noisy. So what, what are the mechanisms on top that you can do? So you can take five measurements and average. That would be a, a very simple method. Um, just, um, just knowing the noise and then the uh, maximum resolution. It took me more knowing the noise. Um, we can start to determine like, what's the noise. Um, like, who are the maximum resolution? I can have minimal resolution. I don't know how to get it. I don't know how to get it. I don't know how to get it. And then you can kind of say, start with quantization noise. And then say, OK, what sort of noise is my signal having? Apparently, if those are, if, you know, quantization noise is large, larger than the noise in your signal, then you probably have a better ADC. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Did anybody come up with an answer? How would how would you even start start this problem? The number of bits? Yeah, the number of bits. Yep. It would be uh, 3 minus 0 over 2 to the 12. Yep. And then because there's a quantization error of like 1 and a half, then it's plus minus 1 and a half. Yep. So I think this is what you got here, right? So you're taking your voltage range here with 0 to 3 volts. So you're going to take this voltage range and you're going to cut it up into little slices. Right? And what? How do we determine that mapping? Well, it says it's a 12-bit ADC, so uh, 2 to the 12 number of little slices in there. So then how big is one little slice, right? And then you're going to take, so that, that is the amount of error 
essentially, that you have. This is the smallest thing that you can resolve. Okay. Is this small? You say no. Why do you say no? Um, I guess because voltages can be very, very small, like max Planck length, like the H is very, 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 very small voltage. Okay. You went, you went to the extreme. You went to the. the I, he's telling us the secret. There's another quantization, the Planck, the Planck value, right? So ultimately, nature is quantized. We won't get there yet. But um, yeah, I guess the question is: This is actually. I mean, it depends on your application. Is this big or is this small, right? Um, and that's kind of a touchy-feely answer, I suppose. But you get to decide if do you need some way. If this is a really small, if your signal is very is on the order of this signal, right? Of this error. Uh, say you had a, you know, a 400, 400.4 nanovolt signal, this ADC is really not going to be able to measure that. There's no way to, to, to deterministically get the value of that signal out of this because there's so much inherent noise in your quantization. You might need to change something, right? And so that would be you could amplify the signal with an op amp or something and make the signal larger so that it's more uh, within the range of your hardware's ability to, to resolve that signal. That's one way to do it. All right, any questions on how we did that? Oh, yeah? Sorry, what is the uh, 1 over 2 again? Like uh, times delta, what is it? Because it's, it's plus or minus. Oh, okay. So saying this plus or minus. Oh, okay. So there's a full bit of error, but you don't know whether it's plus or minus when you look at it. OK, so there's other games we can play. Um, signal con basic signal conditioning. Again, this is not 216. Um, so you have some signal, right? And the goal is you need to get it. If the signal is outside the sensitive range of your ADC, then you're going to miss something. So almost any ADC or DAX have a positive and negative um, rail. So you can have VREF negative, VREF positive. For many uh, low-end microcontrollers, it's just going to be ground. That would be VREF zero. VREF negative, and then VDD would be the top uh, VREF plus. That would be most ones. Your microcontrollers have an option to set alternative values for those so you can change the range at which you're going to quantize over, where, where you can set those little steps. So you could change it so that um, wherever your signal appears is where you're going to sample from. So that's, that's nice. Um, that's typically the case is more that the signal doesn't vary enough so that your range is too large. And then maybe you could say the ideal range would be, you know, your signal takes most of the full scale of your uh, input voltage range. Uh, maybe you want a little headroom at the top and a little headroom at the bottom. All right, so let's see. We have to come up with a transfer function. So whenever I think about uh, this is kind of the mental model I have in my head when I'm trying to figure out the transfer functions between voltage to, to uh, binary values. So say you're given a system that has goes from 0 to 2 volts, kind of a typical scenario, I guess. Then you're going to break those little steps. Each one of these steps is going to be a particular voltage value. So then any value in between here is going to be given uh, the code 001. Any value here is going to be given the code 010 and so on. But you get to have control over that. So you could change that to 5 volts and say 1 volt if you wanted to, if your hardware allows it. And now you have a different voltage range, a different transfer function. Now you're saying, all right, you're going to break your stuff. In this particular case, it's a 3-bit ADC. And you're going to break it up into eight little steps. And now you're saying anything between uh, 0.15 and 2 is 001. So it's important to think about how this voltage range, the stop, start and stop of it, translates to your binary code that you're going to get out on the other side. Yep. Did the thing go past two? Oh, okay. Let's edit slides right now. Very good. How's that? See, it's, it's a team effort here, all this learning we have to do. All right, I think that's correct. Thank you for pointing that out. All right, 
Um, we talked a little bit about the dangers of aliasing. You get some signal you're trying to sample, but maybe you haven't fully characterized it. Um, maybe, you know, it could be from all sorts. Of, maybe, let's say, an example of um, uh, like a beam that could vibrate or something with a strain gauge on it. And so, you, but you don't, don't fully understand all the oscillations that can occur. And you don't want to undersample a signal and then be deceived. And I'll show an example of that later of when that can be a problem. Um, so typically what you do is you do some basic signal conditioning to kill off all those high frequency signals so they never get into your ADC. That's the safest way to do it. You can do that with uh, a low pass filter. And so, sorry, that's this structure here. Um, you can say, do I really need to do, do I really need uh, conditioning all my inputs? And the short answer is yes, you probably should. It depends on you know, how well you understand your signals. The long answer is all, most ADCs inherently are doing it for you just by their design. And so you need to, um, we'll talk about some ADCs later in the class, but there's a bunch of different c configurations that inherently have uh, low pass filters built into them. Uh, SAR ADCs are not one of them. So our ADCs almost always need an external filter or else they're gonna get corrupted signals. That's a, a pain point. Um, but you need to go read the data sheets to figure out is your particular ADC, does it, does it require an, an external filter? Also, those external filters are gonna be at some particular sampling rate. So when we talked about oscilloscopes, they have a filter on it that only allows 200, uh, in that example, 200 megahertz in. You could have a signal that you actually wanna slow everything down a little bit to go out 10 megahertz, let's say, you might, you might consider wanting to put on a uh, low pass filter on the input just to ensure there's no other signals. It's up to you and your application, something that you should be aware of as inherent limitations of sampling uh, analog signals. Okay, and then if you get real excited, and now this is the part where I'll do an extra special hand waving for ADCs or 216. You can go look, make yourself a nice bloaty pot. This is enough just to re remember that old professor sample said, hey, watch out for this, and this is the slide you'd have to go through to help design your uh, input filter if you really wanted to. Okay. So let's go through an example here. Uh, this is a mental model of data conversion. So you have some physical phenomena, and we need to turn it into engineering units, okay? Some black box. So how do we get there? You have some physical phenomenon. You usually need a sensor. What this really means is a transducer. A transducer means taking some physical form of energy, transferring it into something that you can measure. So take pressure, turn it into a voltage, take change in resistance needs to still, so it could be pressure to change in resistance, then you have to change it into voltage, right? That's the world we live in is the voltage land. If you need a transducer, it takes physical phenomena, turns it into voltage or current, yes, some ADC to quantize it, then you come out with a value of ADC counts. How, what's the binary value that represents that voltage? Then you need software to turn it into engineering units. Doesn't matter, you know, you're making your Nest thermostat, everybody wants it in Fahrenheit or Celsius, it doesn't matter what your binary value is, that's not usable to, uh, to users. All right, so we'll go through an example here. Um, so here we have a transducer, this is a very typical uh, analog uh, temperature sensor, three pin device, right? Power VDD and then some analog voltage that's proportional to temperature. You're oftentimes given something like this. Here's a temperature range and here's the, the analog voltage. And so what I'll have for you guys to do, the thing is try and figure out if you were given this temperature sensor, uh, how would you go and turn it into, you know, what are the expected ADC reads on the other side, basically? So what's the minimum step size of your ADC? We kind of already did that. What's your transfer function? And if your ADC is, or your temperature sensor is at 50 degrees C, what's the ADC value? And then there's trick questions like, what's the approximate sampling frequency you should use for this? You guys are, of course, well. Thank you. 
Really, you can talk to each other, I promise. <laughs> it's not an exam. <laughs> Well, I thought the step size was the, uh, like the ABC thing, so it's 3.3 volts divided by 2 volts. So, so it's like the ABC. Yeah. Both the two. So it should be 2 to 10. Just bringing the value of 15. And then we can get the volts. Because like, this is the maximum range. I guess you would just give what you want. It always seems to be like a point. It's also a secret tweet. It says it's record from the sensor. Even though the sensor has a maximum output. Yeah. Oh, uh, I think I think you have to use the voltage for the It's going to be positive. It's going to be zero to so zero would be zero. Yeah. That's pretty good. And then choose the ten. Uh, four. That's just that's just touchy feely. There's no exact answer. So it's a more like yeah, it would be yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 the resolution is determined like what's the range now what's the range of the temperature Yeah. 
Pick a number. They can be just going to go with their random zone. Yeah. Pick a number. Now. 10 hertz? Okay. That's about right. Why do you use that? You don't know. What does it matter? Right. Oh, this is a zero signal. Well, I have like a, like, you know, I send it like a 10 bits like a number at a time. So, in that case, uh, my head is like, make sure it would capture with the, the whole, the whole 10 bits of information at a time. So, will that part matter with that yeah. Yeah, like if you think you're too slow, you're probably going to miss some things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I get what you mean. Oh, okay. I got it. Oh, I got it. 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 I got would you, how'd you guys come up with a minimum step size? What'd you get for an answer? 3.22 volts. Yep, that's why I got at least. I could be wrong. We already found out that I need help with slides, so find out. So here it was just, you got your, we, we've been nice to you that says that the negative rail here is gonna be zero. So you only have to really Think about this is when they say the negative rail of your range is something other than zero. We're going to say zero to 3.3 volts. Why did 3.3 volts we chose is because it's a very common voltage for chips. Uh, usually like 5 volts, 3.3, 2.8, 1.5, 1.8. Those are very common 80, uh, power rails. And so typically you're just going to use your power rail as your reference, high, end, high side reference for your ADC. And you're just going to take 3.3 and divide it by the 2 to the n bits that you have. Yeah. What about the transfer function? How'd you go about doing that? Yep. Let's see. So I did something like this. V temp. What did I do? Oh, I, I did a whole bunch of simplification. So I say ADC value goes in. Here's what. So basically, I should have said the idea here is you've made, set up your system and you're sampling the heck out of this ADC, right? And then you got some binary value. What do I do with this binary value, right? I'm in software land. How do I turn this binary value back into some value that the user could actually use? And so you can take your transfer equation. Here, you put your binary value in. I simplified a bunch of numbers. And then that'll give you your temperature out. Anybody get anything close to this? Nope. Somebody said yeah. Yeah. Uh, what does the V ref do again? V ref is the. Oh, oh sorry. So uh, we got two V refs. We have V ref positive, which is this side, and V ref negative, which is zero. Many problems in ADCs are going to simplify and just say V ref zero or V ref negative is always zero. Uh, so otherwise, it'd be ref positive minus v ref negative. Okay. So what's the ADC value at 50 C? Let's see. Well, let's see if I got that right. Three six two one. Okay. I've done these slides enough times that I've caught my errors this time. 
Um, so that's just the inverse of the equation that we just wrote. Basically, you're just saying um, you got to figure out, uh, so you take 50C, put it through this transfer function, and then you need to put it through the transfer function to get out uh, ADC values. All right, now here's the hard one. Oh, I guess you have to make sure, does this make sense? This is a, this is a good logical test. Um, basically, you put this value, uh, you, you put this value into, divide it by uh, the number of bits you have into 3.3, you're saying, okay, that should be about 1.6. And you just, I always like doing that because I feel like, okay, is that in the middle of my ADC range? Does this make sense kind of as a double check for myself? And here, that makes sense. I feel like at 1.6 is about there. Okay. How about the, the squishy feely one? What's the, what's an appropriate or approximate sampling rate? What should you use for this uh, temperature sensor? Yes, how fast does temperature fluctuate? Well, that's true. Well, they never told you an example. So these are all the things you have to come up with some justification. So you guys came up with, I need to know the application. Well, that's great. Make sure your manager, your customer tells you what the heck they're using the thing for, what their expectations are. Let's say it's for human scale things, not nuclear reactors. Yeah. Now, that sounds about right. It's rare that temperature fluctuates so quickly uh, that you really, that you're going to miss some information. You could do probably do every minute too. Yeah. Okay. But you don't need to do 200 megahertz, right? There is, there is a range here and you don't, you know, your ADCs on your dev kits are going to go, I think, uh, 6.8 mega samples per second, something like that. It's the fastest you can get them to go. That's really fast. There's no earthly reason why you need to be measuring temperature that fast. All right, any questions on this problem? Okay. So I figured I could uh, talk about, a, uh, oh, I said it hurts here. Fast is fine. Okay. So I'd figure I'd take a, a chance to tell you a little bit about an old research I, project I have, but net, you are not all qualified to do. You can basically almost do all parts of this uh, research project. And we wanted to understand what objects humans interact with, right? We don't have a lot of great tools for that. Your, your computing devices, your phone only really knows uh, what you've told it. Like I'm supposed to be in class right now, so I have a calendar notice, has GPO, GPS location, but that's about all my phone really knows about me and the world around us. So we wanted to figure out how are we going to understand uh, another way to understand the world around us. So uh, we observed that all uh, electronic devices give off some EMI, so electromagnetic emissions. And, you know, because you have um, buck converters or the screen drivers or everything is giving off some electromagnetic noise. And I mean that from like, this is plot some 30 megahertz to one gigahertz, but it can be much lower as well. It's just giving off some noise. And the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, mandates what noise or what signals can be transmitted from the device. And they say, well, we don't care as long as it's low power. And as long as it's underneath that blue or red line, you're just fine. So this is a terrifying figure. If you get out in the real world and you see this, this means your project just got delayed by three months because you failed your FCC uh, emissions test. It's bad news bears. But what we didn't realize, oh, so we want to start capturing these signals to try to understand the world around us. And so we made a smart band uh, what did it have in it? Had had a Teensy Cortex M4. Uh, Teensy is nice because it's actually uh, this version was a hundred megahertz clock. No, it's even faster. Than that. I think it's a gigahertz clock. Pretty fast clock. Has a reasonably fast ADC. And then all we did was put a, a op amp in there to boost the signals across these two electrodes. And then we had a battery and a Bluetooth module. So it's a very doable 373 project so far. And what we noticed is that when you touch devices like your phone, where's my phone? Right, this by touching it, there's a signal. This is a, the it's an old iPhone, but uh, you get an EMI spectrum that comes off of this thing from say zero to three megahertz because your phone drivers are pushing out noise. And what we didn't realize, or it took us the the, the fun part of this is didn't realize at first is that all the electronic devices around us are giving off different spectrums of noise. So if you can measure the spectrum, then you can figure out what those things are. So, you know. Uh, 
what is this, a Honda, uh, is very different than the LAMP, very different than the Mac, uh, iMac, very different than the iPad. All these things have different spectrums. And so what we did, we also knew that these signals don't go very far, but they'll couple to your body really, really well. So if I touch this, these things will travel through your body, and we made a little wristband, like you said, and it can measure the EMI signatures as they couple and travel through your hands. So we made a smartwatch. Uh, we go and sample it with an ADC, do a little baseband shift, this particular version. Uh, before that, we have an image of what background noise looks like. And basically, we say if the, if the signal we have is sufficiently different than the background noise, and we'll say, aha, we found a signal. And then we pass that to some really basic machine learning. Here, we just use support vector machines. You could use random forest. All my students love neural networks. Oh my gosh, it's so great. I tell them if you can't get it done with support vector machines or random forests that like maybe your signal doesn't really exist, but I'm old and cranky. Okay. And so this is what you can do. This is kind of interesting. This is a cut pretty fast. So we have a the smartwatch and this particular version is a little old. We have a USB cable coming off of it. We didn't have Bluetooth on this version yet. And as you touch things, the uh, laptop's gonna classify in real time the object that you're touching. So a spark from the stove, toothbrush, scale, trackpad, or the table's out also a touch screen. It's not obvious here. You track all the things in your in your work, workshop. Motorcycle, that's an electric door lock, it's not obvious. Why was a ladder? Now a ladder is not an electrical device. Why was a ladder have an EMI signal? Yeah, but um, I don't know, my, my water bottle's conductive, but I don't necessarily think it's actively transmitting a device. Oh, it is an antenna, okay? It is an antenna, and here's where our aliasing problem came in. We didn't put a filter on our ADC. We were like, ah, we're too smart for that stuff. We'll just put it right through an, uh, a high-speed op amp, high-gain op amp. And so it took us a long time to figure out why was it in this, oh, this is a, a frequency plot of this. Why was there signals coming at this particular frequency? And so we're undersampling. We're going about 2.3 megahertz at this, with this ADC. We found out that we're undersampling a local country radio station in Pittsburgh. It took us forever to figure out why did the ladder have a signal? And it wasn't 60 hertz either. You assume 60 hertz is what our power system does and you find that everywhere. Um, but that was a, a radio station. Okay, so we went through. If you've never seen a confusion matrix before, this is what we oftentimes use uh, to explain machine learning results. So we say you had uh, A through W objects, okay? And then this is the percentage of time they were classified as A through W. So for instance, W, we didn't even mark it here, is 100% of the time, and it was actually a fairly large data set. Usually people cheat and have really small data sets in really controlled environments. They're like, oh, I got 100%, you never believe them. Um, but sometimes it failed, like it didn't do well, like O, which is a gas range, was sometimes confused with J, which is a Honda motorcycle. And if we look at O and J, you can kind of see why, right? They kind of have the same, uh, spe shaped spectrum, and I bet we could do more fancy machine learning or collect more data to, to disambiguate that. But those are pretty uh, amazing results for somewhat persistent uh, signatures that are time invariant uh, and function invariant so that you can train to understand what you interact with. All right, any questions about that? Yeah. Nope, my students aren't that lucky. They had to go, you know, go, go get your own database. It's not, actually, this one's an easy database to, to get because you just go and put the wristband on. Um, and you basically, we created a machine learning platform for real-time machine learning classification called t for train where you go and grab something and then you just basically press space to capture samples. And these samples are very well behaved and then you just press T for, to train on that sample. Okay. 
Oh, it could be any, wouldn't it be nice if your computing systems knew more about what you were doing? So right now your computing systems don't know really much at all what you're doing. So you could imagine we had, uh, so it's a fair question, right? So the research here was, can you get these signals in any reasonable way? And uh, then the, there could be a more moral question of, do we want computers knowing more about us? That's a fine question to have. Um, this was uh, eventually picked up by Apple, but they didn't do anything with it. Um, but anyways, uh, so we, one of the things we investigated was guided uh, uh, tutorials in the shop. So you could figure out what you're interacting with in the shop. Um, there's other times when you'd want to know what you're doing with. In other research, we looked at like eating behaviors, not with this watch, but with other watches. Um, yeah. Or if you want, there's people that are like life loggers that want to know all the things they've interacted with. There's lots of niche applications, but we haven't figured out the killer app yet. Any other questions? Okay. So recap these, this. Um, so sampling theorem, it's important to know what Nyquist is. That's great, you have to sample things twice as fast, but then you also have the oscilloscope sam sampling theorem which says you should sample five times as fast. Just make your life easy. You'll be able to understand the signals that you're looking at. Um, we talked about quantization error and resolution and understanding the limitations of those. And then it's always important to look at, be able to figure out the transfer functions uh, between some analog value uh, into some uh, engineering units and keeping track of the in our example, as we looked at reference voltage being negative, uh, or re negative reference voltage always being zero, uh, but it could be negative. It could be some arbitrary value as well. Okay, we still have time. I have another, we can start ADCs. Oh yeah, and research is fun, I tell you this. Research is fun, that's why I'm here. Okay. Um, go on to ADCs. Any questions before we get going? Okay, so now we're actually gonna dive into how do you actually construct an ADC. The goal is to so you say, where are the trade-offs in ADC types? And if you're choosing an ADC for a particular application, which one should you choose? Typically, ADCs are all like, you have internal ADCs into your microcontroller and you have no choice over it. But if you go look on DigiKey or any of the online resources for buying parts, you find that there's a huge amount of external ADCs um, and oftentimes use them because they're faster or lower power or then, or have some other features that their internal, internal ADC doesn't have. And that's when you'd start looking at different topologies and different pros and cons of different types of ADCs. If you want um, you know, more learning on this, uh, these are some good resources. Uh, the reference manual actually does a pretty good job on how ADCs work, uh, online resources as well, as well as uh, the textbook that I've mentioned in the class. All right, so I'll talk about sample and hold, a couple different ADC types, and then the ADCs that you have on your device. Again, this is just, we're trying to recreate the functionality of your uh, fancy oscilloscope for like $3. That's, that's our job here today, okay? So the, maybe the, the first part of an ADC is what we call a sample and hold circuit. Uh, this is, a, you have some analog value that comes in, okay? And then you have some control element, which is going to, you have some, uh, this is like a buffer, so you have some analog value that comes in, it's gonna be stored on this capacitor, and you're gonna open it up, and you have a, a, a stored version of that analog signal on this node, which then goes to, say, another op-amp, and now you can do something with. This is an inherently important part of ADCs, you're able to sample and hold a value to be interrogated later. What you don't want to have happen is, we'll show you some very slow ADCs that we'll show you later on, things that take time but are cheap, let's say, and you don't want to have a time varying signal going on those corrupting the measurement. So you, you sample and hold it. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, you know how I love Falstad, so we'll show an example here. So let's see, we have a time varying signal here. This is the six or 40 hertz here. And then we're gonna sample. Basically we're connecting this structure, which is hard to tell. This is a, a pass gate. 
And what we're just going to take is a version of that signal we're going to store it on this capacitor. You can actually see the current oscillating back and forth right now as the time variance signal changes. And then we're going to let go of the, the sample button here. And now we've got a version of it. Wherever we let go, we have this version. And um, this particular cap doesn't have any res parasitic resistance associated with it, so that thing stays a long time. Sometimes uh, there is usually a finite amount of time you could hold something on a capacitor. Any questions? Yeah? Um, so with the, with the sample voltage, it just holds the voltage that you get in the MMR signal at when you hold it? Yep. So I, I guess I, I can't tell what So I'm sampling right now. You can see that this, ooh, oh no, I broke it. All right, so when I push down that button, the version of this signal goes all the way over to here. Gets onto this capacitor. So I'm going to sample, okay? I'm going to sampling part, and then I hold it. And you can see over here that this value is kept when I let go of the, uh, that button. And we thought that it's under millivolts? Because... Millivolts, yeah. Here, you tell me when to stop. Okay, so now you can see this, this plot here shows the value on the cap. So now the value on the cap is changing. Stop whenever you want. I'll stop now. And that's the value is being held on this capacitor. And then it's through this buffer. So now I can go do things to this, this value. I can sample it, manipulate it. Make sense? All right. Um, you know, there is an inherent problem here where there's uh, some sort of RC charge, right? Because you're charging up a capacitor. So in that last example, we had this uh, sinusoidal source with this infinite output current. It was great. It would always charge that, that capacitor to the right value. But sometimes you don't have that. And your um, data sheets will say there's a minimum sampling time for a particular uh, normal, typical signal. If you have a very weak signal, you might find that it actually takes longer to charge up. You can't go as fast. You can also cheat by only charging up part way, but you have to do a little uh, software offset to account for that uh, in your signals or in your in your software. All right. So the next and maybe most common ADC, not common, yeah, say let's say common, is a flash ADC. Basically, what's happening is you have your reference voltage, uh, whatever that is, so we said uh, before it was 3.3 volts, and uh, your negative rail here, in this case, is ground, going through a voltage divider. And there's different ways to set this up. And basically, at each one of these nodes, there's a reference voltage, right? So um, here, it's a little bit less than VREF, a little bit less. This is about middle, let's say, a little bit less, a little bit less, right? So now you have a ladder of little voltages, little voltage steps, and you're just gonna compare the input voltage to each one of these little steps. And you just have a little analog comparator and then a binary decoder. So this is a quick way to basically compare this voltage to that voltage uh, and then turn that into a binary value. So sometimes I think it's easier to see in simulation. So if you remember that the color is proportional to the voltage, and so here we have seven volts up here uh, this value is 6.5, this value is 5.5, the value of the, where the cursor is is shown right there. And we're showing that here I have a ladder of reference voltages. How do we feel about this ladder idea? Yeah? So is it just taking like points in the analog um, at various uh, points and converting that into binary? Yep, so we have our references and we're going to compare this ladder to our input signal to figure out what is the value of our input signal. And I saw a hand up there. Have a question? No. Nope. Okay. And so these are just comparators, and all a comparator does is says is if the voltage uh, on one leg is higher than the other leg, and positive input is higher than the negative input, then I'm going to raise uh, this pin high, and if it's not, I'm going to keep it low. And so here I have this ramping. Sign a, a ramping sawtooth wave that's going up, and you can see that it's stepping through these values. So you can see, oh, let me stop here. Let's get through one cycle. So the input value here is 
of this thing is 2.5 volts approximately. You can see that in the corner. And so we can go through and say, well, is that larger than this first step? Well, this step, first step is 0.5 volts. Um, so yes, it, uh, the input is larger than my reference, therefore this pin is high. Is it higher than 1.5? Yes. Is it higher than 2.5? No. Because this is actually, I lied, this is 2.497. So we're three millivolts off in this, little, in this simulation, so this line has not gone high. But if I go like that, now the input voltage increased a little bit because um, we ran the, the simulation forward, and now it's at 3.1 for a better example. And we see that 3.1 is higher than whatever this is, 2.5, and therefore that bit's high. And then we just have a little decoder here that turns in this, um, uh, this, these ones and zeros here into a binary value. Yeah? Uh, what is the logic gain, like, So these are just, um, this isn't binary, right? The output of these aren't binary, right? It's just saying that what's one is higher than the other one. So you just need some logic to turn this into a binary value. So you could make this, this logic array any way you want it, but basically it's a, a decoder or encoder. Does that make sense? Okay. So what do you think are some of the advantages of this apology versus the disadvantage? Do you have a question up there? Okay, where are some of the advantages versus disadvantages? Yeah. Well, are, are you sure you're not an ECE student? That sounds like an ECE student answer right there. He's exactly right. It takes up a lot of space. What takes up the most space here? Resistors, yep. Resist, you would think that resistors are uncomplicated devices and that you know, op amp or comparators or logic gates are really complicated, and so they must take up more space on a piece of silica. Nope, resistors take up the most space by far. Capacitors probably, capacitors are bigger, but resistors are way bigger than, than digital gates. Um, so resistors are large. What else, where are some other advantages or disadvantages? Uh, yeah. I guess it's accurate to how many how many resistor ladder steps you want to have on there, but yeah, it's still it can be accurate. It's just that you're gonna there's I bet there's a a point at which you know two to the twenty four number of resistors is going to get a little out of hand. Maybe you don't want to put up with that much area on your die just to get a high high resolution ADC. I think I want to get to the idea that because these are large, there's an upper limit on what's practical. We don't make really large uh, flash ADCs, uh, large in the sense of uh, number of bits, because uh, the amount of area is just not worth it. We'll show some other topologies that are smaller that will give you the higher things. What about uh, other parameters like speed or power? I mean, it could be 3.3 .3 volts. It doesn't have to be. Whatever, it's always some voltage coming into it. That's not the like, voltage remission issue. Another one is that. Sure. So there's a, power, there's a power consumption of the ladder itself. The, the comparators are actually pretty power consumption, pretty high power consumption if you think about it. You need one per bit. So that doesn't scale that well. What about speed? Yeah, this is one of the fastest types of ADCs. So this is what you'll find in high-end oscilloscopes. You don't have a lot of bit depth. Maybe, maybe even most oscilloscopes are only 16 bits. Maybe they'll get up to 18 bits. So they're not really high bit, but um, they're very, very fast, right? You can get it done in less than a cycle. So then, in that, in that sense, can you have a high sampling rate? Yes. This is fast. You can have the, high, the fastest sampling rate is with this type of ADC. Maybe not the most accurate, but the fastest. I mean that in the sense of in practical situations compared to other ADCs, which you'll learn about, this is uh, one of the fastest. All right, and, and but it's going to be one of the smaller uh, bit sizes. OK. Let's see if we can get through one more ADC here. Uh, another type is uh, a slope integrator. We'll also just briefly discuss 
Nope. Nope. We'll briefly discuss the dual slope integrator, but once you understand the slope integrator, um, the dual slope integrator is just a caveat on that, but the dual slope is more uh, typical. So basically what we're, the idea here is that um, you, instead of, we just saw that if we wanna measure things very precisely, we are gonna have to have lots of resistors. And so this takes a different approach. It says, instead of trying to have it's resistors that quantize things. Let's use something that a microcontroller is really good at, and that is measuring time. Computing systems are, going, are better at measuring time than anything else, and so we're going to change our measurement system to time. And basically what you're saying, we'll show the circuit in a second, but you have an input voltage, and you're gonna compare it, you're gonna charge up a capacitor essentially, um, and you're gonna say when your capacitor equals your input voltage, then something then you're done, and you're gonna use a timer to count how fast that went through time. So here, um, you're gonna use time as the ADC value, essentially. Um, probably much easier to see in Falstad. Okay, so in this circuit, we have our input ADC. Uh, we can change this voltage if I move that around. Okay, uh, we have a reference current going into a capacitor, and that's gonna, so a current into a capacitor is actually a straight line, it's not an RC charge, so you get a straight uh, increase in voltage. And so basically we're gonna race, this line is going to go from zero up to some value, and when it hits this value, then our simulation is gonna stop because our comparator is gonna say, okay, it's done. And then while that's all happening, our ADC uh, timer is gonna be running through. Okay, so let's see what happens here. So here, this is our value here. This is our slope reference. This reference is increasing until it meets the input value. This is the value put into our ADC. And when these things to meet, we'll see what binary value is out on there on our counter. So there you go, they've met, and here's the binary value. We can uh, decrease this voltage. I reset everything. Oh, go. What? What's the problem? Huh? Huh? Oh, it went very fast. Oh, you're a good point because I made it very small. Therefore, less time went through. Our binary value is one. Aha. Well, I'm glad. See, it's good. You guys must know this stuff if you're teaching me how it works. I like that. Um. Let's make it bigger then. Two uh, volts. I did it again. Come on. Two. Apply. Reset. Go. There we go. That races, and now that's a new time value. So um, you can imagine in the extreme, we're going to have. Um, uh, we are gonna have a very fast clock with a, with a high number of bits of a timer, and therefore you can slice that very, very accurately. Yeah. Um, so how does the timer help us understand the analog signal? Sure, so here we see this value. So here's our analog signal in red. It is at two volts now. Um, we don't know that. We don't know that, nobody knows that. You're measuring that, okay? you have this green line which is going to keep track of time for us a little bit. It's going to, it's going to increase um, deterministically because you're putting, say we have a very nice controlled current source which is possible to make in silicon easily. Uh, it's going to push current into a capacitor and then you're gonna have this nice ramp function that comes out of that. This, this ramp comes up and when these two meet, then some amount of time, then you know that this voltage here and that time is at the same thing and we know how much time has passed. And now we have time is gonna be proportional to this voltage. If we go longer, or if we go shorter, then it's gonna be a smaller uh, ADC val uh, analog value. If we go longer, it's a higher analog value. Does that make sense? What other questions do we have? I don't think it makes sense. Yes? It could, you're absolutely right. What can we use to overcome that problem? There we go. So this is, the advantage of this sort of circuit is that 
it's very small. Sure, we, all the circuits, we need some sample and hold probably in front of it, but it's slow. But we don't need a lot of resistors. So this one can be very high resolution. So in um, multimeters, especially some of the, like the five unit precision ones, this is the sort of thing that they have in those because it's cheap, you don't care about speed when you're talking about multimeters, and they can be very accurate, more accurate than a flash because it's easier to get uh, more bits. This speed is like, it gets slower the longer, the higher the voltage is, right? No. No? Because we're not taking the input voltage here. We're taking a current. So a current into a capacitor has constant rate. It's not an RC charge. But the intersection takes longer. Oh, yes, that's true, right? So the high, yes. I see what you're saying. Uh, the higher the voltage, the longer it takes, the more time elapses, and then this counter counts up. It starts, counter starts when you start the simulation, whenever uh, the current starts going to the capacitor. It starts counting up, and then we have the value that's of time that's passed here. So this, you just read off your value. I guess I should have remade the simulation so that we can actually plot these things down here, and you can actually read off the ADC value. Yeah, we could go charge up faster. What? What would happen? Um, well, what would happen? So say we make the slope faster. What happens to our, and uh, the clock speed doesn't change. What happens to our resolution? You lose resolution because now to, to get to a certain thing, it took less clock cycles, right? So now uh, what you'd want is to either increase your clock rate as fast as possible to get the highest resolution or to have that slope go slower and slower and slower so that you can increase the number of top clock ticks that could happen for that voltage. What other questions do we have? All right, we'll go through the dual um, ADC and we'll do SAR tomorrow. Uh, oh, I didn't even put a title on that one, fancy. Um, okay, so the, this is just for your knowledge because this is a less common the, what I showed you is practically what you need to know. However, there's a more common version, which is the dual slope integrator. And that one kind of looks like this. More complicated. What we're going to try and do in this particular one is we're actually going to charge up uh, with our unknown voltage, and then we're going to count the passage of time with uh, a known discharge um, because you don't know uh, Practically, it just makes it simpler. So uh, for the sake of education here, we'll show you how it works. So here, I'm going to press start. Start is going to connect this switch, the input voltage, to here. And we're going to start charging up. And then we're going to keep track of time going down with this known reference source. Okay. So that started it off. Here, we're charging up. This input value is being placed here. It got up to some, after a certain amount of time, it stopped, it's always the same amount of time, and then we're watching the discharge time here. So we sample for a small amount of time. Input voltage, we may not get up to the, you know, here, this is only uh, 3.8 volts. It happens to be about half of this voltage. Um, we're just saying the amount of voltage was able to charge up a capacitor. We charge up this amount of time, and then we're gonna count out how long that took against this known reference source. So this is the typical way you run uh, slope integrators is their dual slope integrators. You have the unknown charge up time, and then you have the uh, discharge time at a known rate, and you count that out. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll end there, and we'll pick up on SARS on Wednesday. Oh, and turn in your sheets. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that increasing the clock 